Thank you, Erin. So I'm William Hurtling. Um, I am so happy to be here today uh, because IndieWeb has been hugely influential on the stuff that I've written. So uh, I write science fiction basically about technology and uh, how it affects people and how it affects society. And I'm probably best known for two books, uh, Avogadro Corp, which I wrote quite a while back, and Kill Process. So the first series I wrote, the Singularity series, was focused on AI and uh, progress toward the technological singularity over like the next 30 years. And it was full of big ideas and basically pie in the sky extrapolations of where technology was going. But when I wrote Kill Process, I wanted to focus much more on the current day, uh, making it an intimate story about people who exist now, um, grounding it in the technology that exists or that's right on the cusp of being developed. And I wanted to tackle issues that I thought were crucially important. Who owns our data? Um, how we control the flow of our information? and how we can take ownership of our online presence. So just out of curiosity, how many people are familiar with it? Anyone besides Aaron? A few people, all right, woohoo. Um, for the people who aren't familiar with it, I'll briefly describe the idea. So the main character, Angie, is a database engineer and a data analyst who's also a domestic abuse survivor. And she works with the world's largest social networking company called Tomo, and she uses her access to everyone's data to profile abusers hunt them down and kill them, um, mostly through various computer hacks, uh, pretty much all of which are real or close to real. Uh, so when Tomo, but she, has, she goes through this big change. Tomo violates its user's privacy in yet another new way. And Angie, for the first time, really sees that Tomo is the greatest abuser of all. People cannot escape the social networking giant. Um, all of their friends and relatives are on it. And if they try to quit, they're basically cut off from their real world social network. Um, and they become imprisoned in a system that commits a one abuse of power after another. Does that sound familiar? So Angie decides the greatest good she can do is to destroy Tomo. And the way she's gonna do that is to build a new social network based upon principles of decentralization and data ownership and federation. Now, coincidentally, like right at the time, I'm in the pro middle of writing this completely independent from anything else, um, I met Aaron and I got an introduction to IndieWeb. Um, and within a few minutes of talking, it was obvious that IndieWeb embodied a ton of important principles that were directly relevant to the book. And so I tried to weave as many of those into the novel as possible. Um, but as much as I like the principles of IndieWeb, what Angie creates in the book is something different. Uh, and the reasons why it's different, I think, are important to understand, to look at the future of IndieWeb and what that means. So Angie builds a platform called Tapestry. Now, when I thought about Tapestry, I was looking squarely at what generation four of IndieWeb would be, because I wanted uh, Tapestry to have to work for anyone, regardless of their technological literacy. Um, and that meant it had to be as easy to begin using as Facebook, but with the potential to grow to more sophisticated usage over time. Now, like IndieWeb, Tapestry features a plurality of projects rather than mon monoculture, um, but, um, Tapestry themselves builds both a reference implementation of every, every single component, um, as well as providing the APIs so that anyone else can buy one, build their own implementation. Um, so all the things you'd expect, right? Microblogging, photo sharing, long form articles, commenting, friend management, readers, everything's an individual component and users of Tapestry can onboard and choose all the components they wanna use. Um, preventing lock-in is really crucial. So Tapestry mandates that users' data is stored on the data storage service of the user's choosing in a well-defined format. Um, this was just one way to make it easier for users to switch between implementations. And it's basically a principle of Tapestry that anything that creates a switching burden is strictly forbidden. So lock-in as a business strategy is simply not allowed. Um, and that's a big difference, right, from the current world. In the current world, lock-in is considered a benefit, but it's only a benefit for the company that creates it and it sucks for everyone else. Uh, IndieWeb is also focused on today the public sharing of information, which totally makes sense when you consider the web's roots and how it's been used over time, but it fails to take into account the fact that people who use social media want more control over who can view their content. And we can debate whether that leads to a more authentic life or not, but from a pragmatic perspective, if we wanna get people off of Facebook, we need to give them ways to share content that they're comfortable with. 
Um, and in a distributed and federated social network, that's a challenging problem to solve when my friends list is managed by one service and my friends friend list is managed by another and all our identities are distributed. Um, I actually spent like a week whiteboarding at work. I didn't tell anybody what I was working on, but I was like, I'm gonna make sure this can all work and like I'm doing restful calls and sequence diagrams. And at the end of it, I was convinced it is plausible, it can be done. Um, so I wove that into the novel. Now, most of the problems we have with the corporate web that exists today stem from the fact that money is involved. Um, companies and people want to make money. But as a writer, like, I also want to make money. Like, making money isn't bad. Um, so I felt like that was an important thing I had to address. Um, now, one of the other things is I really, really hate ads. So I wanted to figure out a system for that too, right? So it's like kind of cool, like writing a novel is inventing all of this stuff without having to actually write the code. Um, <laughs> that's why it's much better than coding. Um, so what I came up with was that Tapestry would have this uh, system of micropayments and basically a framework for tracking participants and content delivery. And really this is like the core value that Tapestry adds be behind defining APIs. Um, so if I share a photo and you view that photo, I should get something for creating the content, the people who host the photo should get something for it, the reader that you use should get something for it. Like everyone deserves to get a reward for their contribution. Um, and having the system of micropayments would enable that. And it also enabled, by having one system of micropayments, it also enables different ways for money to get injected into the system. Am I gonna pay a monthly fee and get an ad-free experience across the entire web? Am I gonna allow ads and now have that do it? Or am I gonna have some other form of sponsorship or subsidization? So briefly summarizing the differences, right? IndieWeb has historically focused on tools for developers and the technically sophisticated. Um, and it has a barrier to entry, and I'm gonna talk more about that. Um, Tapestry tries to make those same benefits available for the end user who doesn't understand how it works and just wants to use it. Um, IndieWeb has also focused primarily on self-hosting and people scale solutions, whereas Tapestry focuses on large scale service-oriented solutions. Um, but then it takes these steps to ensure that users still have agency by avoiding any sort of lock-in. Um, IndieWeb focuses on public content. Tapestry looks at the many different granularities of access control. Um, and historically, IndieWeb doesn't address money at all, but Tapestry recognizes that money is a primary driver behind the web that we've built. Um, and facilitating the exchange of money in a way that scales seamlessly with how people use the internet, right, it's intrinsic to broad scale change in the web. Um, having a revenue model isn't evil, but it is helpful to both long-term stability as well as the scalability of what we create. So each of these differences is something I see as critically important for the future of the web. Um, and the more IndieWeb finds a way to address these issues, the bigger the scale of change it can make. So uh, I'll finish with one other anecdote. So I was at a homebrew uh, website meetup a couple of years ago, and I, I, all I can remember was that Aaron's host was under some sort of attack at the time. So we're all sitting there, we're all talking about IndieWeb, we're all talking about our websites, and Aaron's basically just trying to defend his website. And <laughs> um, now this is the sort of stuff I deal with in my day job, right? I'm a full stack developer. Um, but what I don't have is I don't have very much time, right? I'm splitting my time between my day job, writing, kids, partners, um, and I can't guarantee that I can drop everything the way Aaron is at that moment to uh, deal with my website. Um, what's more realistic is my site would go down and I'd discover it like days or weeks later and still not have time to deal with it. So here we are, we're talking about IndieWeb. I'm considering moving my blog to a self-hosted website and I'm not actually sure I have what it takes to do this. Um, and if I don't have a, what it takes when I've been a you know, full-time developer since 1995, then that means that the overwhelming majority of Facebook users out there, all those hundreds of millions of people, right, they have no chance whatsoever. Um, so I'm basically like an IndieWeb Gen 1 user who wants a Gen 4 experience because I'm lazy and I don't have much time. Um, <laughs> so there's nothing I want more than to rebel against the powers that be, right? I want to know what it will take to topple Facebook. And so it was a little disheartening to me that night that IndieWeb, as promising as it was, was not enough as it existed, right, to make that scale of change. So let me talk about my protagonist, Angie, for a second, right? She also wants to rebel against the establishment. She's me after all. Uh, she's a powerful person, and she'll do anything to accomplish her goals. She'll kill people if she has to. I don't advocate for that. <laughs> um, but the other thing about her is that she basically wants to sit behind a computer and code. Like, that's how she wants to spend her time. And she values 
what she can create when she's programming. Um, and she's dismissive of basically everyone else. She's dismissive of management. She's dismissive of people creating slides. She hates that stuff. But the biggest change that she has to go through in the book is realizing that if she wants to change the world, she can only do so much as a lone coder. Um, she's going to require working with other people, getting funding for what she wants to do. Um, at some point in time, she's going to have to make a presentation instead of code. Um, and she hates every moment of all of that. But she does it anyway um, because she recognizes that's the world that she lives in. And she ultimately places pragmatism over principles to a certain extent. And she'll do what she has to do. So when I come, ba come back to IndieWeb, right, I see a bunch of very passionate people working to take back the web, and I see them using principles that have worked well over a long time, right? Self-dogfooding, working code, scratching out personal itches. These are all valid, effective approaches to working, right? I use them myself. I think we're all comfortable with them. But we desperately need to break the world free of the corporate web. Um, and that means we're called on to do more. It means we have to be pragmatic. It means that it's going to require working and communicating with others outside of the developer community that's going to make us challenge us, move us out of our comfort zone. Um, if IndieWeb is going to change the world, it means building larger scale services. Um, and if we don't want to do it all ourselves, that's great. It means reaching out to people who will do those things. Um, and if you re have read any of my books, you know I see programmers as the heroes who save the world. Guess what? That's you guys. <laughs> um, all right. So. Before I end, I'm going to talk briefly about Kill Switch, my next novel um, that's going to be out in September. Um, it takes place a couple of years after Kill Process Tapestry has grown significantly, and now they're the 900-pound gorilla of the social networking world. Privacy and individual control over one's data is more important than ever to Angie and company, but they've been hit with a FISA court order that will mandate backdoors into Tapestry, with the result that the government will soon be able to read whatever they want, negating much of the benefit of Tapestry's privacy features. Um, this is unacceptable to Angie, but she has no legal recourse. Now, Cory Doctorow has compared privacy to a clean, safe drinking water supply. He says it's possible for an individual to build a water catchment system, including a cistern, to last through the dry season and add the purification and the plumbing necessary. But what we've discovered as a society is that it's more effective and efficient to make the government responsible for centrally purifying and distributing drinking water. So Corey says that privacy is similar, right? The government should be mandating and enforcing privacy, and that's more reasonable than each of us trying to maintain our own security. But what choice do you have when the government is actively hostile to privacy, when the back doors that they create and maintain actually weaken security? Then there's no choice but to solve the problem ourselves. So Angie decides she'll need a technological solution, an approach that will guarantee everyone's privacy even in the face of these government-mandated backdoors. And I won't go into the details now, but if you add onion routing, client-side containers, and distributed ledgers, it is possible to maintain the features of the web and social media we have today while simultaneously making it resistant to even government-level intrusions. Um, and that's the majority of the plot line in Kill Switch. Um, in parallel, the themes I explore include freedom, control, legitimate versus abuse of power, and the effects of power on those who have it and those who don't. And Kill Switch will be out in September. Thanks. <laughs>